I'm grateful that you guys came today in the midst of all you're going through. Uh, if you don't know, this is their fourth Sunday with us, but they're ours already, right? <laughs> so we're grateful for them. Do you guys have time to talk about the kingdom? Okay. All right. Let's go. Matthew chapter 5. Oh, they have, the sermon notes will pass out here in a second. That thing. Uh, quickly, where we've been. We're on the Sermon on the Mount, and as we look at the Sermon on the Mount, the reason we're going into this uh, is there's just a clearness that, uh, that our world needs a lot more Jesus, right? Our culture needs a lot more Jesus. Our homes need a lot more Jesus. Our individual lives need a lot more Jesus. And, and there's this understanding that as the times get closer to the end, there's this abomination that causes desolation that sets itself up in the temple. Right? That's in scripture about the end times. And, and there's the thought that, yeah, someday there will be another temple and it will set itself up there. But there's also the fear, the reality that we are, through Christ, the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that there is this deluge kind of experience that's coming over. And you see Christians really uh, becoming less and less passionate to a degree. But there's also a deeper hunger for the real following of Jesus Christ. So we need more Jesus. We need more his words, his ways, his truth in our culture, our community, our church, our lives, and our kids. As they're at children's church, may, may they experience more of Jesus this morning. And so as we look at this, it's important as we look at the Sermon on the Mount that we look at it the way Jesus intends. Because without understanding, it can lead us into trying to follow a bunch of rules. And that's so grateful for the testimonies that we've had. Uh, because each time they've spoken to the sermon. Uh, and, and Jolene and Jared definitely talking about that difference between religion and relationship and growing up in a religious structure and knowing what to do uh, but not having that relationship yet Jolene finding it outside that on her swing set. I love that part of the story. It's not about this list of rules to get to God. God has come to us through Jesus. But we also don't read it and read it as a list of rules and realize we can't do it and so we then just give up and just do whatever we want. Again, speaking to the testimonies we heard this morning. Instead, we understand that the Sermon on the Mount comes along with the main message Jesus preached, which is repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And he's saying that to people who everywhere he goes. And so there's that understanding is that they're not currently in the kingdom. I'm telling you, turn away from where you're at because you're in a different kingdom than the kingdom of heaven. Turn to, step into, come into the kingdom of heaven because the kingdom of heaven has come near to you. Think of it like a, a ship landing and, and approaching the dock. The kingdom of heaven has come near. You can enter into it. And we have to understand that as we look at scripture, we have to know that we belong to the kingdom of the world until we step into the kingdom that Jesus invites us into, the kingdom of heaven. We are in that kingdom when we embrace what he's done for us on the cross by paying the price for our sins, by dying on the cross for our sins and rising from the dead so that we would have power over sin and death. When we say yes to that, that's when we're stepping off the dock into the ship of the kingdom of God's grace and his plan for our lives. But as we then understand looking into the Sermon on the Mount, we have to know that it's going to be very different than the kingdom that we're in. I love the students in the religious release class. They've blessed me in so many ways, but they've also helped me see some things that I didn't know I was going in to see. And that's that understanding that so often we just live according to the world's culture. We live according to the, the secular culture. We, we do what everybody else does because we don't want to stand out. And it's hard, but Jesus invites us to flip that upside down. And everything he challenges us to, everything he calls us into is opposite of what the world is telling us to do. And so in Matthew chapter 5, we begin by saying, who is blessed? Who are the blessed ones? And we looked at this last week. Who, who are the people that the world thinks is important? I looked up the term. I did a search on my text messages for the term blessed. When did I use the word blessed, and, and what context was it in? And uh, it, it's, it was with birthdays. As I always say that, like on uh, Facebook or somebody has a birthday, I'll say happy and blessed birthday. I just want to have a happy birthday. I want it to be a blessed birthday. But I also did it a couple times in relation to finances, which, man, that felt shallow. <laughs> I was like, we did this fundraiser, and we raised a few thousand dollars, and, man, we were blessed. I'm like, man, if the king of all kings blessed us, I think we'd be a little more excited about a few thousand dollars. We'd be thinking of so much more, right? Uh, and there were some other terms. There was, there was some that just, just caught me off guard how, how I use that term. But Jesus, when he says, these are, these are the people who are blessed, it's different than what we'd expect. It doesn't match up with the world's blessed people. And this is where we came to last week, really the conclusion of the first three and four blessings. When you realize the world doesn't have what your heart was made for, 
Was, you see this kingdom. You see all that it is. You see the, the kingdom of money. You see the kingdom of pleasure. You see the kingdom of fame. You see the kingdom of, of whatever, relationship. You see all those kingdoms, and you realize, oh, that's, not, that's not what my heart longs for. And your heart aches for something so much greater. As Hebrew says, you're longing for a greater country. And you realize you can't fix it yourself. You can't find it yourself. And yet you long for it. That's when you're in the precipice of true joy. It's like you're standing on the edge of a cliff ready to jump into the greatest, most luxurious thing you could ever experience. That is when you're on the precipice of joy. Or it's like the door is cracked open and you're right there. All you have to do is just push it. You're, you're, you're right on the edge. When you understand the world doesn't have what you long for and you ache because of that and you wish you could do something about it, you can't fix it. That's when you're on the press, because that door is cracked open. All you have to do is push it open. Jesus says you're blessed when you're there. So that's where we've been. So then we step in to where we're going in the next couple of blessings. And let me start with this question. What are you prone to lose or misplace? And, and I would prefer if spouses answered for their spouse. <laughs> because you're not going to say what you tend to lose, but your spouse will be, yeah, this. And Jessica's not in here to defend herself, so I would gladly throw her under the bus. Um, <laughs> She tends to lose her keys. She tends to misplace them. Uh, she tends to uh, anybody else. A and it's not that it's gone, but, but her tendency is if they're gone, then it's, it's maybe the, probably the worst situation um, possible. Uh, and, and I'd lose things too. I've, I've lost things and searched and searched and searched, and then it's in some place like this, right? <laughs> do you ever do that? You get, you get up in the morning, getting ready to go out, and you can't find your keys anywhere. You search all your code, you look at the laundry, everything you can. You open the door and there your keys are in the, on the other side of the door because you did not pull them out after you unlocked it when you got in. And you guys don't understand that because half of you don't lock your doors. <laughs> you didn't grow up in Wichita, Kansas. didn't grow up in the hood, so you don't know. You know what it's like to lock your doors. You had to. How many of you lose your password and you can't remember it? And so then you have to try to figure out a new password. And so you put in a new password and it tells you this. It can't be the same as your current password. <laughs> right? You ever have that happen? It can't be that. Who is blessed? Who is blessed? The second part. The first part is the broken are blessed. The mourning are blessed. The incapable are blessed. Those who long to be filled are blessed. And what's it take us to? Let's read Matthew chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. So I'm going to propose something, and, and I need you to understand that this is opinion. This is my viewing of the scripture. I believe it is in sync with what Jesus intends, but it may not be in sync with what every theologian or pastor thinks, but I do think this is how it lands. When you look at the, the nine Beatitudes, the nine blessings that Jesus gives, are they, are they random statements? Are they just all over the place? These are people blessed, these are people blessed, these are people blessed. Or is it strategic building? And, and if these nine blessings are random statements, then they're still amazing. They are powerful. They, they are life-changing. I believe if they are connected, which is where, how I read them, how the Spirit has taught me to see them. And he taught me this many, many years ago, um, and it's stuck with me. If they're connected, if they're linear, if they're building, if they're like a ladder building us somewhere, then I, they, they are revolutionary. And they teach us how to step into the kingdom of heaven. And I believe that's Jesus' intention behind it. You don't have to agree with me on that. That's okay. Read the scripture and come to that terms on your own. But we're going to go in this aspect because we're talking about who Jesus says are the most blessed. So let's look at the rewards like we did last week. The rewards in this one are, are if, if you're blessed, you will receive mercy. Anybody want that? Yeah. Yeah? A little, you guys mumble. I get accused of mumbling. You guys mumble when I ask questions. See God. And the bless, you'll see God. These are the two rewards for the blessings that Jesus says. You're blessed if you're this, and because you're going to receive mercy. You're blessed if you're this, because you're going to see God. Anybody want that? I too. I do. Pick me. I want that. I want to see God. I want to be with him forever. I want to make it. I'm like Paul. I want to I finish well. I don't want to finish average. I want to finish poorly. I want to finish well. And so as we look at this, then, then what are the requirements to receive those things? Well, the two requirements are merciful, to be merciful, and the other is to be pure in heart. Okay? So let's look at the first one. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. That makes sense, right? That's clear. Good? All right, let's move on to the next one. 
Blessed are the pure in heart. Right? Pure in heart. How many of you here today are pure in heart? If you want to know what, what the Greek means, which I'm sure you're wanting to know, pure means pure, clean, completely clean, I mean not dirty, and in heart means the core of who you are. Who here this morning is pure, clean, not dirty, in heart, in the core of who you are? Nothing wrong. Anybody? No? Why would Jesus say, let's have the pure in heart? When, when, who is that? Who could possibly measure up to being pure in heart? But who besides Jesus himself qualifies for that blessing? And that seems out of character that he'd say, blessed is me because I'm better than you. That's, that's, not, that's not Jesus. So who is he talking to? And why does, that, why does he even say, blessed are the pure in heart? Who could be pure in heart? The Bible has a lot to say about the heart. Proverbs says, above all else, guard your heart because it's the wellspring of life. It's really, really important. It's the core of who you are. But then we read in Romans that every single person, read it with me, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So who is pure in heart according to Romans 3, 23? Nobody. And Jeremiah one-ups it. He's like, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Beyond cure. Who can understand it? Who is Jesus talking to when he says, blessed are the pure in heart? Well, again, let's go back. Is it random or is it strategic? If these nine blessings are random statements, not connected, then they're powerful. If they're connected in the building and taking us somewhere, then it's revolutionary. The connected view, a.k.a. what Chris thinks. But I think I have the spirit when I say that. There's nine statements. Okay, say nine with me. Nine. That means there's three groups of three. three. And in the middle of the nine, there would be number... You'd have four on one side, four on the other, and in the middle there would be five, yeah. First three, describe the broken condition. Poor, uh, poor in spirit. Broken people. Mourning. And meek. Incapable. The broken condition. The state of all humanity. The second three... Describe a transformation that happens. The third three we'll get to. Not today. We don't have time. The transformation. Hunger and thirst for righteousness. You understand you're broken and you long for yourself to be made right. And then there's something else that happens. And then you're pure in heart. There's this transformation that happens where you're longing in, in the fourth blessing to the sixth blessing where you're pure. Where something, something happens there in the middle where you go from broken to holy from impure to pure, from, from a sinner to a saint. But what happens in the middle? What is the key that unlocks this understanding of the Beatitudes? The nine statements connected and building on each other, laying in the middle is the key. And the key is mercy. Would you say mercy with me? Mercy. mercy. The only way, and I know you'll agree with this, the only way to go from broken in sin to from being a sinner to being pure in heart is to be washed in the mercy of God. The only way that I can ever stand before you and preach the word of God is that in his mercy, he has taken me from my sin and forgiven me of my sin, separating it, throwing it away, and then clothe me in his righteousness so that now, because of his grace, I am pure in heart. Are you with me? Yeah. Makes sense. Okay, it's like this. It's a trail. It's a key. It's not just any trail. It's not a trail to some dump. It is a trail to paradise. What is the kingdom? What is the trail to the kingdom? The path is mercy. The only way to receive the mercy of God, the only way I can become a, 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 a saint instead of a sinner is through the mercy the only way to receive the mercy of God is through Jesus Christ, is by being merciful yourself. And this is that sermon that you guys don't like, and you've heard it before, but you're going to hear it again. And I'm going to say at the beginning of this, this does not minimize hurt. This does not minimize wounds. When we talk about mercy, we're talking about a way of living. And we're not talking about an individual act. We're talking about walking a path the rest of our life with Jesus, and that's the path of mercy. Mercy received must 
have mercy given. That's not Chris's rule. That's not Bethany's rule. That's not the church's rule. That is the Jesus Christ statement that to receive mercy, to receive forgiveness, we have to give it. And so as Jesus lays out, you're blessed when you're broken. You're blessed when you mourn your brokenness. You're blessed when you realize you can't fix it. You're blessed when you long for yourself to be fixed. You're blessed when you're merciful, because then you will receive mercy. Blessed when you're pure in heart. If you want to leave this place this morning, if this morning you're like, my heart's not right with God, but I want it to be right with God, you need this word. Merciful. Would you say that word, if other people described your characteristics, would they use the term merciful to describe you? Let that sit for a while. <laughs> we don't want to think about that. But if you are summed up by another person, would they include the word merciful in a description of who you are? This is a consistent and difficult teaching that Jesus teaches consistently throughout Scripture. It's something that's in Scripture throughout the Gospels, throughout the New Testament. There's nothing that we just pick out of the, of the air here that's consistent. So what is mercy and what is mercy not? What mercy isn't? Mercy isn't a feeling. Let's say that. Mercy is not a feeling. It's not a feeling. I don't, I, I don't have to feel like forgiving someone. I don't have to feel like being merciful towards John to be merciful towards John. It's not a feeling. It's not. The emotions, emotions change with what you eat. You know, if John and I have tacos, which we do from time to time, and I have something I shouldn't have, and the next day I don't feel great, I'm not going to feel as merciful as normal. But that's not, that mercy isn't a feeling. Mercy is also not a single act. You can do an act of mercy, but being merciful, as Jesus says, blessed are the merciful, it's not a one-time thing. It is a path that we walk in life. And mercy, and hear this well if you've been hurt, mercy is not an elimination of consequences. Do you understand what that means? God has mercy on me, but that doesn't mean when I do something dumb, I don't have to reap the consequences of doing something dumb. It just means that he's not condemning me to hell for it. Right? If I maximize all my credit cards on a Ferrari, I don't know, make it up as I go, yeah, I'm still going to have the consequences of that. doesn't mean eternally he's going to hold that against me. And mercy is not an elimination of justice. That's really important as well. Sometimes we feel like in order to have mercy, that means that justice doesn't exist or that consequences don't exist. That's not true. That's not the biblical view of mercy. God's view of mercy towards us is to forgive us on an eternal level. And when we see that, he does not take away the consequences. Sometimes he does. But not all. So that's what mercy isn't. What mercy is. Mercy, and I love what C.S. Lewis says. He's, and he says, mercy is forgiving the inexcusable in another. Because God has forgiven the inexcusable in me. And to do that, I have to understand what I've done to God. And how I spent a life in rebellion against him. Even as I've said I've followed him, there are times that I've taken that off the table and walked away the other way. And I don't think I'm the only one. Forgiving the inexcusable in others because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. Mercy is that. Mercy is, mercy is something, basically mercy opens the door for God's salvation to work in that person's life. In other words, instead of pulling that door shut and nailing it up and saying that person cannot walk through into God's mercy and into God's salvation, into God's forgiveness, no, mercy says yes, they too can enter and true mercy makes room for clear justice. When there's real mercy, you can have justice instead of revenge. There's a difference, right? Revenge is what we see in the movies. Justice is when right really happens. True mercy clears the way for justice. In other words, it's saying that as, as much as I want this to be true for me, that I can step into God's grace and into God's glory, I also have to let it be true for another, even if they've hurt me. Super easy, right? So mercy depends on a clear understanding of my brokenness. If I don't have a healthy understanding of how broken I really am, that poor in spirit, and how desperately I need the forgiveness and grace of my Lord, then I'm not going to be able to give it to somebody else. I have to have a clear understanding of my own brokenness. And if you don't have that, then read your Bible, and God will teach you how broken you are. The Bible is full of examples. 
That mercy depends on a blessed receiving of that grace of God. It has to understand what I'm receiving a free gift that I do not deserve. So therefore, I am not allowed to not have others receive that gift as well. And receiving requires ultimately this humble submission that God is God and that he is judge and that he knows better than me. And that's probably the hardest thing to do is that God somehow is smarter than me. Right? And then mercy also depends on this. A consistent movement towards a refusal to condiment. <laughs> Man, that is not what it's supposed to say. I don't have a joke, but there it is. <laughs> Woke you up. You know when you condom, you know, you tell them to catch up. <laughs> See, mustard would be better than that. Yeah. <laughs> and you really relish the time that you have together. I can run with that. A consistent movement towards a refusal to condemn. Condemn another to hell. Man, that really ruins that sentence. <laughs> and a willingness for holy and right reconciliation. You know what it means, right? When I have mercy on somebody, that means I'm not determining where they go. I'm leaving room for God to save them. So ultimately, though, friends, mercy depends on Jesus. And I, I just say this from my heart to yours. I don't know your suffering. I don't know the wounds that you carry. I don't know the arrows from others that have been flung at you. And I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what it feels like. And I don't pretend to. But I know that you've received wounds. And I know that the only way through those wounds is through Jesus. And I know the only way to release those who, hold, who held the bow that shot the arrow is through Jesus. And Jesus isn't calling us to do something that he's not willing to do with us. Mercy depends on Jesus living in you, walking with you. Being merciful isn't something you do and then Jesus accepts you. Being merciful is a path that you start walking on with him, forgiving through you as you are forgiven by him. I hope that helps. The last thing I want you to feel this morning is that there's no way that you could possibly embrace the forgiveness of the Lord. You gotta understand, this is not humanly possible. It is possible through the power of the Holy Spirit working in you and through you. So when you say yes to Jesus, you're saying yes to walking that path of mercy. And you're making that commitment, not the kingdom of this world, because they don't believe in mercy. They believe in, in retribution and vengeance. They don't believe in justice at all. But the kingdom of heaven is about walking with Jesus on the path of mercy. It's about seeing that door and allowing ourselves to walk through it and allowing others to. So I am on the doorstep of true joy when when I see my own broken state, blessed are the poor in spirit, for they will receive the kingdom of God. I'm blessed when I mourn that brokenness, for I will be comforted, knowing I can't fix it. I'm blessed when I know that I cannot fix that on my own, because that's going to teach me to see the hand that's reaching out to save me. I'm blessed when I long to be made whole and right, because then when I hear the invitation of Jesus to follow me, I will follow. I'm blessed then when I see other people are just as broken in their sin and life as I am. And I have compassion on them. Just like I want God to have compassion on me. Oh, it's so hard. It's not easy at all. But with Jesus, it is more than doable. I'm on the doorstep of true joy when I have a heart that has been and is continually being made pure by God. You see the transition? You're broke. You mourn that brokenness. You long to be fixed. You can't fix it. You long to be fixed. And Jesus invites you into his mercy to let go of the chains that bind you as you let go of the chains that bind others. And he purifies your heart. And there is no purity in heart without that step. Then what happens? Well, then you see his face. I don't think you can see the face of God. I don't think you can hear the voice of Jesus very clearly if you're holding on to the chains that you're binding others with. Easy. <laughs> so easy to say. Forgive me for, for making light of it. It's not easy. But there is a kingdom of God that we're invited into. And these are his ways. And if we want to walk with Jesus, 
we want to walk with him, if we want to hear him say, follow me, and we want to answer that with, yes, I will follow you, that means we have to begin to take steps on the path of mercy. So I'm not asking you to wash away everything this morning. I don't think it happens that way. I think what I'm asking you to do is take the hands that have nail holes in them because of your sin and mine. And so, Lord, teach me. Teach me how to love those who've hurt me. Teach me how to forgive like you forgive. Teach me how to leave the door open for even them. Amen. The kingdom of heaven is not something we add to our lives, friends. It's not something we just throw in. You can't do that. You can't live in this world and try to add mercy. It doesn't work. The kingdom of heaven is what you build everything around. And that's what Jesus is inviting us onto. It's like that dock. We're stepping off of the land and into the sea of God's mercy and grace. So let's do that because he is the way and the truth and the life. So let me ask you, do you feel this morning that brokenness? Do you understand that you yourself are broken in sin without it? Do you understand that, 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 that you can't fix it, and that you need it? Do you long for Jesus to fix the brokenness in you? If you do, when Jesus says, follow me, hear that and say, yes, Lord, I will follow you. I'm going to invite Jared and Jolene up here because they're going to lead us in communion in just a moment. Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13 says this. Will you long for his mercy? Will you receive it in you? Will you allow it to work in you and through you? Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. What are they? Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you'll call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. And what's 13 say? Will you say it with me? You will seek me. And find me when you seek me with all your heart. What do we have to do? We have to admit and confess our need and our brokenness. We have to believe and accept that he has fixed it, that he is the solution, that he is the rescue. And we have to commit to walking that path of the kingdom of heaven with him. In other words, we have to hear Jesus say, follow me. And we have to say, I will. I will. So have you done that? Have you done that? As we take communion this morning, and, and Jared, I'm sure, is going to speak a little bit about it. But as you take communion this morning, make sure that if you do so, you're saying yes, not just to receiving mercy, but yes to holding Jesus' hand and letting him walk you down that path of mercy towards others. Okay? I surrender. 